Hi, my name is Gwen Mazza and welcome to The Art of Transitions. It's a pleasure to have you here in our audience today and we will be inviting one of our wonderful guests and her name is Stacy Henning. Stacy's going to share with us on the topic of my wake-up call. So hold tight and we'll be right back. Welcome back to The Art of Transitions. Again, my name is Gwen Mazza and I'm your host. Thank you for joining us. Our guest today is Stacy Henning. Stacy is actually the Marketing Director of GRE. Thank you for coming, Stacy. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I asked you to come today and you're going to speak to my wake-up call. And as many of us, including in the audience today, have had, we've had major life shifts. And in those major life shifts, we have a wake-up call. And as I spent some time with Stacy a while back, we worked together in different avenues and That's venues. Right. Um, she was kind enough to share some of her life story with me, and it touched me so that I thought it might be of value to the community here. And if you would, and she was willing to actually share what she experienced, so that others might uh, be able to pay attention and walk through grace with some of their life experiences too. So my wake-up call. Miss Stacy, you're a mom of two. That's you right. You work at GRE. You are a resident of the Rochester area, and you came back here seven years ago. That's right. And you said you had a wake-up call. Can you tell our audience a little bit about our conversation? Well, four years ago, um, I was just living my life, get going, getting up, going to work, taking care of my kids, and I went in for my annual mammogram. Mm -hmm. Nothing was wrong, or so I thought. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 41. So very young mm -hmm. for some, someone who doesn't have any breast cancer history in my family. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point in my life, that was a pretty dark period for me. Mm -hmm. There's no question that I was stunned that, that I would be diagnosed. Um, so you were just going in for a routine mammogram? Just, I'm a poster child for why you should go do your annual mammograms because there was nothing that I would have thought was wrong with me. And that's so powerful in and, and and our audience. Please know that this is so important that we take care for ourselves. And thank you for reminding people to do that. And we'll remind them throughout the meeting today, the presentation today. Yeah, and you know, if, if I think about my life, I was leaving, leading a very healthy life. Mm -hmm. You know, exercise, eat the right things, or so I thought. And I was diagnosed with stage zero. If there's a stage to have of cancer, that was probably the best stage. It was caught very early. Um, worked with wonderful doctors, a team of doctors over at Highland Hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, here I am four years later. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, I'm, I'm in a great place right now. It's mm -hmm. in my rear view mirror, so to speak. But at the time I was going through it, very private. Um, did not talk about it with many people at all. My family knew and um, my uh, boss at Jiri knew, um, and just a select group of, of friends. And it's funny because it was during that period that I ended up losing a little bit more weight, and people asked me if I was a triathlete. Oh, really? Because they're like, you're really thin, you're really fit, what's going on? Are you a triathlete? And I was like, you know what, I'm not a triathlete. And in my head, I'm like, but I am running a marathon. Mm -hmm. There's no question that um, juggling work and my family and having 30, 30 radiation treatments, mm -hmm. I definitely felt like I was running a marathon. So would you be kind enough to take our audience and one more time, if you would be willing yeah. to take me back to the day and walk me through the marathon as opposed to running it now sure. that you can see it. And I love the image you use because you are capable to talk about this topic today and it is in your rear view mirror and yet it was very, very shocking from the first day. Oh, you Tell know, I was in denial in. at first. Okay. Tell me about when you walked in. You had your mammogram. Everything's done. I had you my mammogram. Out. Actually, no, it wasn't so easy. I okay. had a mammogram, and you sit there, and they go, the doctor needs to take some more pictures of you. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, the doctor needs to take a biopsy of you. Okay. This is same all day. in the same morning, my, my son's birthday. So I'll never forget that day for a variety of reasons. And then they said, we'll call you within 24 hours to let you know. So that is a very long time. Mm -hmm. Tell well, me about the 24 hours you know, going home. Going home, a lot of tears, a lot of tears. Um, 
processing the fact that, you know, they must have the wrong person. They, they must have picked, mixed up my films with someone else's films because this can't be happening to so me. So that was some of those thoughts that was going through your Yeah, mind. a sense of this isn't real. This, this can't possibly be my life. It can't possibly be happening to me. I don't know anyone who's in my family who's gone through this. 24 hours later, I did get the call from the doctor, who, and she confirmed that I did, in fact, have stage zero. Mm -hmm. So when they Breast said cancer. to you, we'll call you and let you know, that's a pretty powerful line. Yeah, because you want, I mean, everyone wants instantaneous feedback. Right. And while to you, 24 hours doesn't seem like a long time, it's a long time to walk with this uncertainty mm -hmm. about your health and how serious. Mm -hmm. And how old were your kids at this um, time? Let's think. Um, Jake was 10 mm -hmm. and Samara was 6. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Samara was in first grade. Mm -hmm. Jake was in fifth grade, I think it was. So. We had to cancel a family vacation because of this. You know, we, we were all set to go away to um, Nova Scotia, and I said, I can't possibly go on vacation if I'm facing surgery and radiation treatments. And so for the kids, they were very supportive, and um, Joe, their father, was supportive of that decision. Mm -hmm. And I just really needed to take some time to sort out what I was going to do, and I was afraid. I didn't know how I was going to react to the radiation treatments. Mm -hmm. And I encountered some wonderful people. Both my family was so supportive and so, um, I don't know, um, kind. And of course, you'd expect that a family, or you'd like to think you could expect that a family. You'd hope and that. Right. Um, and I shared it with just a select group of friends. And one happened to have been a cancer survivor herself. So she was an amazing cheerleader for me, okay. checking in with me. How you doing? How's it going? And, and then after a couple months, I started radiation treatments. So when the doctor called you the day after and said it's stage zero, can you um, share with our audience the different stages or at least the number uh, stage that you know of? I know zero through four. Okay. So, so you know four is the most four. severe. Most and severe. if you're, you know, I got this education I had no anticipation of getting in my right. life. Right. And I was diagnosed with stage zero cancer, which certainly um, is a form of cancer that needs to be treated. And they were pretty aggressive with a lumpectomy. And, um, 30 radiation treatments. I went five days a week for six weeks to Highland Hospital. I had to find the strength every day to get in my car after work and drive over to Highland and, and I put my iPad on and I, they used to joke when they saw me coming in because I was a woman on a mission. I was gonna just power through this and treated it like a work project. I just said, if I, I'm okay, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do it with grace and I'm gonna um, just use all the resources that I have at my disposal that I know calm me down. And music is one of those things that mm -hmm. definitely calms me down. So I had my iPod turned up really loud. It was actually an iPod my sister gave me, That's so that I didn't nice have so I didn't have to listen to the the sound of the radiation, you know, the machine. machine. Right. And they'd have to scream to me to let me know what was, was going time. on. It was time, and it was done. And that was the best way for me to. Um, to get through the process and actually my sister really was so helpful to me. We're close but we haven't lived in the same place for 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, she's three years older than me and she couldn't be there with me so she gave me the iPod just so because she knows that music is something that, that um, lifts my mood. So I listened to my favorite music on the way over there. I listened to my favorite music during the treatments and she also gave me a bracelet. She did? She did because she wanted, well she couldn't be there because she doesn't live here in Rochester. She mm -hmm wanted me to know she was holding my hand. And so that bracelet was a wonderful reminder of the people in my life that really care about me and are getting emotional. It's okay. They're because for me. You know what? This you know? is a big piece. This is an emotional part of our lives. And major changes do that. Yeah, and I think what happened was through the illness, I got clarity about what's important in life. And that's where, when you and I talked about the title for this, yeah. my wake-up call. Yeah, some people never get that wake-up call. You know, you're right. And, and I true. am so grateful that I got the opportunity to, talk, to stop and really assess what was important to me in my life and Breathe focus my energy mm -hmm. on the people and the um, experiences that, are, that matter and not put things off. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I mean, my daughter and my son are so important to me and just being able to really cherish those moments that I that I have with them and I remember only one night that I get truly sick during the radiation treatments and I was exhausted didn't miss a day of work 
went to do the radiation treatments, you know, fulfilled my obligations at work and also was a mom. Mm -hmm. So my second job, so to speak, kicks in after, mm -hmm. you know, work's over. Exactly. And I was in bed and my daughter came in and she put her head on my arm and she just looked at me and she said, I love you, mom. Mm -hmm. And that was one of those defining moments when you go, that's why I'm here. That's right. You know, I'm here to be a good mom to them and I'm gonna get through this. And I think my kids really see the strength in me mm -hmm. and I'm proud of that, that they recognize mm -hmm. what I've been through and are appreciative of all that I do mm -hmm. for them and that I'm still here, mm -hmm. you know. Stacy, when you and I talked about you doing this show, can you share with our audience why it was important for you to come in and be with me um, to do this show with me today? As you sit here, I look at your strength yeah. and it is quite you know, I. I had a few select people that had been through their own tough journeys right. who were my rock, right. who really were there to remind me of um, that maintain a positive attitude is so important as you go through this to um, just, you know, life's not going to end. Just, you know, yes, you're sick. It's okay to cry. It's okay to feel sorry for yourself, but also focus in on the things that make you happy. And since I've gone on this journey myself, I've been able to turn around and help other people. You know, friends who have, spouses who've dealt with cancer or they themselves have had challenges, whether it be divorce or illness or problems with work, what have you. Mm -hmm. Just the opportunity to give back and to be there for other people is very important to me. I did not join a therapy group when I was going through mm -hmm. um, my own personal challenge. Just I relied on my own network of friends mm -hmm. and didn't burden people, but, you know, leaned on select people to when I was starting to get hard, you know, halfway through the 30 radiation treatments, it starts to get hard. I bet. Tell me about going through the radiation treatments when you first start. I hear you say, I was a woman on a mission. I actually enabled myself somewhat with some denial by putting up those music real loud. You but know, then I, also I just, knew I wasn't. I just, kn I know how to cope. Mm -hmm. I know how to pull in my own inner strength and what I need to do. And yeah, a few tears were shed on the drive over there, but when I was in there, <laughs> they'd joke because I was the last appointment of the day. Oh, so really? they'd say, don't be late, because that means we can't go home. But, you know, I was there on time, and I yeah. did my thing. Yeah. And uh, the kindness of people at Highland really struck me. Mm. Just so generous with their, you know, their time and just, you know, answer any questions that I had about what was happening. And did that reinforce for you the power of kindness and healing? It definitely does, and just the kindness of you know, I also experienced kindness from friends that I didn't expect, mm -hmm. certain people who really stepped up mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. were there for me in ways I didn't anticipate, whether it be the friend who gave me a book, mm -hmm. my sister who gave me a bracelet, my friend who called me every couple days just to check in and see, are we on treatment number 15? You're mm -hmm. going, girl, keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Just, it, it was more the, um, the thoughts, the energy that was coming my way from people who, in the some very cases, loving energy. yeah, that I'm, Maybe I didn't anticipate, you know, and I and I truly appreciate it, and so it just reinforces for me what I need to do to give back mm -hmm. to other people. Mm -hmm. That is one of the most beautiful things I think about being human is when you and when I and you and I both and others can capture the grace and the gifts that come from every event, no matter how difficult, no matter how challenging those events might be, we have the capacity either to really turn inward and just lose ourselves. Mm -hmm. Or we can take the time to go through that experience and go through the process, and then what we choose to do with it can make all the difference in the world, which was what moved me so when you said, you know what, I'll come on and talk about yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was a great opportunity to really catalog what's important. Every day be grateful for a couple things that happened that day or that week, yeah. and whether it be, you know, beautiful sunset that I happened to experience last week when I was in Israel, mm -hmm. or, you know, the opportunity to play a game with my kids and just laugh, you know, just those precious moments that maybe before I got cancer, I just was just very militant, you know, just doing my job and, and not really yeah. having a chance to be um, mindful. Mm -hmm. of, of all those wonderful things that are happening mm -hmm. around me, you know, and the friendships. The mindful piece is so powerful. And I think that that's one of the things I've really, no, it's not, I think I know that that's one of the thing, pieces that I've watched just being with you over the last couple of years. You move into even greater, greater levels of and greater pieces of. And it sounds like this experience, as scary as it may have been, 
you gave yourself permission to feel the emotion as you went through it. You allowed yourself permission to have the support. And it does sound like you had some great coping mechanisms. And if you didn't have them all, you were able to find some. And people role modeled them and gave them to you in many subtle and quiet ways. That's true. That's true. Um, I'm lucky that I have great parents, a great mm -hmm. sister, um, mm -hmm. you know, great extended family, but I didn't share it with everybody mm -hmm. until I was through it, until I was six months past all the radiation treatments and I, I got a clean bill of health. That's when I knew that I, you know, that I could start talking about it with, with For you personally, of what was that about that time? Because people are just different and so this is your um, journey. You said I didn't share it with others. Tell me and if you could share with our audience why? what happened for you. What? Doesn't matter what happened to anybody else, but just for you. Why didn't Why didn't I share yeah, it? Yeah, what was happening for you um, that? You know what it was is I didn't want it to define me. Okay. You know, it's a part of who I am, but it's not everything. Mm -hmm. And so I was coping with that, but I didn't want that to be the only thing I talked about every day. Mm -hmm. At work, they asked sometimes how I was doing, but we certainly also talked about work projects. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one thing that I'm proud of is that um, Mark, my mm -hmm. boss, and mm -hmm. um, Dennis before him as the CEO, recognized that I never missed a beat. Mm -hmm. You know, I pride myself on my work ethic. And then I was able to be at work every day and do a great job. And I know that they would have been supportive if I you know, I hadn't been able to. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't want to share it with lots of people because it's not the only thing that, that defines me as a person. I'm so, many, so much more than that. And this was also a scary, hard time for me, and I didn't know how I was going to react, and I didn't want people to start dismissing me from projects or opportunities or stop talking to me because they didn't know how to handle the fact that I had cancer, which seems like this evil word. And mm -hmm. People don't know how to interact with you when they know that you're going through something tough. So I'd rather not put them in a position where they'd feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was selective and who I told, which I think was hard on my family mm -hmm. because they wanted to share it with people to right. cope themselves. Right. And I didn't want it broadcast. I didn't send an email blast out to announce it. I was very private about it to the point when people couldn't believe that I'd been through that and that mm -hmm. people didn't know about it. I just. Really. So your style, so if some folks in our audience have a quieter style, it's about honoring that as well. Yeah, I mean, there's no right or wrong. It's about what works for you. doesn't mean that I was isolated. I just was very selective with the, um, the people and the resources that I tapped into to help me deal with something that I felt. I needed to keep private. Now here I am four years later talking know, about it on I your know. TV show. So obviously I'm much more comfortable with it now, but I also feel like I'm a survivor, mm -hmm. you know, and that I have um, a story to tell. And if I can help pull someone else along, just like my friends did for me, then I'm happy. You know? And that's what I'm really incredibly I'm grateful and in gratitude to you for because this will allow others in the audience to know that however they go through their major life wake-up call, whether it's breast cancer or what have you, they have some choices and there is no perfect way, there's no right way, there's no wrong way, there's the way you needed to right. do it, which right. is what I really admire. Right, and, and, and one thing I'm proud of is that, oh gosh, four or five friends have gone and, and, and had a mammogram because of me. Mm -hmm. And each one of them has come back with a clean bill of health. Mm -hmm. And I'm just glad that they know that they're in a great place. But I think I motivated them. Many people put that, that exam off. It hurts. It's, mm -hmm. I don't have time for it. It's uncomfortable. Uh, whatever it is, mm -hmm. this is you know, something you need to do for yourself, for your family. You know. And you never know what it is. It could be, you know, any other kind of test that is just a routine kind of health test, and yet there is true value in that. Well, and thank goodness for modern science. Yes. You know, granted, some of it's a little tough to, to deal with. I did have the gene test to mm -hmm. make sure I didn't have the gene mutation. So you did opt for that. I did, mm -hmm. um, because I'm an Ashkenazi Jew, and right. they have a higher propensity to mm -hmm. have the gene mutation. I'm going to slow you down just a bit, okay. because you and I might know a little bit about this, but the audience may not. So could you share about the gene test and what that means it's, in terms um, of your Gosh, it's the BRCA gene. And, 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 okay. Um, there's tests you can take to see if you have the gene mutation, which would mean you have a higher propensity to get breast cancer, mm -hmm. um, ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. and if you're a man, prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. So um, I 
was counseled by my brother-in-law, who's mm -hmm. a doctor, who helped me tremendously in finding great doctors here in Rochester, okay. the surgeons, the medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists. And I'm going to ask you to speak a little bit to that, too, okay. because that's a whole big part of your story yeah. that's pretty so, rich. So my brother-in-law is a radiologist in Albany. Mm -hmm. He's married to my sister. Mm -hmm. And he was my coach. He identified for me the treatment that I needed. You know, he was my second opinion, so to speak. Mm -hmm. He looked at all of my films. He got mm -hmm. other people to look at my films because I do believe that you should probably get more than one opinion on mm -hmm. something that's so life-changing. Mm -hmm. um, and then he coached me on, on what I needed to do, both the radiation treatments, the lumpectomy, mm -hmm. and also that um, based on my genetic background, being of um, Ashkenazi Jew, mm -hmm. it's Eastern European Jew, and for whatever reason, we have a, um, a higher um, propensity to have this gene mutation, which can cause, which could lead you to, I think, 70%. I'm, I'm not sure right. the statistics, the numbers, but, but a significant higher rate, higher right? rate of getting right. breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and if you're a man, mm -hmm. prostate cancer, that he said he really thought I should consider getting that mm -hmm. test. That was the longest three weeks of my life. Because that was after the radiation treatments, after the lumpectomy, and then I went and I got the gene test, and I walked with this unknown for three weeks, mm -hmm. but I knew what I was going to do with the information. If I was, you know, tested positive for it, then there would be another path to make sure that I was healthy and was going to be there for my kids. Mm -hmm. And luckily for me, mm -hmm. that the longest part was over, and they gave me the results, and I did not have that mm -hmm. mutation, so that was lucky for me, but I also know I have cousins who did have, they did the, have the they test, did have and, they the test and they are still here and doing great. And you know. Do they make different life choices now as a result of um, those results? If you are positive, mm -hmm. I know what I would have done and I know what my cousins have done is you'd go for, um, I think it's called an ophorectomy, I may be mispronouncing the okay. name, but it's to have your ovaries removed okay. and to have a mastectomy. Okay so that you remove the chances the possibilities. Of, of getting ovarian cancer or breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, really powerful and major life choices. Yeah, and you know, it's, you have to know, what am I going to do with the information? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to get this test, what, what outcome? Okay, whether it be positive or negative, what am I going to do mm -hmm. with that information? One of the neat things that I, I notice about working with you and being with you is the way you process information. <laughs> and that is natural to your profile and your yeah. behavioral style. Yeah. And we talk about, um, we have the opportunity to work professionally together. I'm going to slow the process down so when people are going through these kind of transitions, I'd like to borrow some of that process that you use as a gift for our audience. Okay. Is that okay with yeah, you? Yeah, sure. Okay. And based on who you are, you have the capacity to naturally see the, pe see the picture and understand that there's certain steps that need to be taken as opposed to just getting overwhelmed in, in, with yeah, all the I mean, information. Yeah, like I've said so many times, I treated it like a work project. And what does that mean? That means I researched everything I possibly could on the web. Mm -hmm. I reached mm -hmm. out to experts such as my brother-in-law mm -hmm. to get me the best information on mm -hmm. what I needed to do to take care of myself. Did you find misinformation on the web? That's part of the concern I have um, at times when I, when I go on the web. Maybe it goes to the extremes. You know, right. And so you have to take that information and then talk to your doctor. Mm -hmm. and, right. But you also have to be an advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I say that for me because the doctors were at first dismissive of my question about the BRCA gene test. Oh, okay. They were not sure why I would even think that I would need that test. Mm -hmm. And I had my brother-in-law who, you know, was coaching me to say, you really need to check into this because mm -hmm. of your history. And once I reminded them of my history in terms of, well, gosh, I'm the first in my family to be diagnosed with right. this. If you look at the whole family tree, it could be a function of um, the quality of care that we have now that we didn't mm -hmm. have when mm -hmm. my grandparents were alive. Mm -hmm. right. But also because of my um, genetic background as, as an Ashkenazi Jew, um, they were like, oh, okay, I get it now. Now they understand. Now you know, but so but I had to be an advocate for myself. Right, they didn't you know. know. They didn't remember. They weren't thinking that that they was something go, I yep. needed to do. Right, right. Um, so part of that was you took the step of one, you went through the shock. Two, you sat and thought, okay, I'm going to treat this as a work project, and you borrowed from that part of your life yeah. into this current life, and then you broke it down into steps of using my resources, getting how do I want to handle this? Is that right, correct? Right. 
and made some quiet choices around that and asked people to be reverent to that. I'm sure it didn't always work because it we're sure humans. It sure felt like it because my yeah. community in Rochester is very tight and yeah. I was yeah. very close about right. what I wanted to talk about. Right. And I think I have tremendous friends and I think they were, I definitely know they were respectful right. of my request to keep it really. Respectful of that. And I'm sure there were a few bumps in the road. So how would you, if there was a bump or two in the road, how would you, um, how did you manage that? Um, or did you just kind of let it slide off your back and you just kept going? Well, it's kind of my personality to work around it. That's what I would have thought. <laughs> so it doesn't work, I just work around it. So that's what I'd like the audience to borrow too, is to maybe sometimes, if you can give yourself permission, to figure the way around any of the bumps. And that's yeah, one of and the it's things not I really that I was superwoman, because I'm right. far from that. I had my fair share of t fear share of tears, mm -hmm. um, why, why me mm -hmm. attitude, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, I recognized that that really wasn't going to help me get through this. Mm -hmm. So while I gave myself permission in my mm -hmm. car or at home or behind closed doors at work to feel a little sorry for myself sometimes, you know. Feel sorry or be, allow yourself to be scared? Or a little of both? Both. Both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when my friends get clean bill or my sister gets a clean bill of health when she goes for a mammogram I think that's great yeah that's but wonderful. there's also a part of me that feels like that's why nice. is it so much harder sometimes for me that's yeah. all it's yeah. human nature that's you and know? thank you it is human nature so it's nothing unusual it's nothing no. out of the ordinary and, and you are incredibly human which is what some people would say it's because you can handle so much they say and I'm like okay mm -hmm. it's okay that's well, okay we'll hold but on to you that know, one. sometimes I'd like it to be a little easier yeah um I, yeah, and um, in the process of this, um, my marriage wasn't working out, and so, you know, that, you know, made choices there too. But, um, you know, I think it's my personality is not to get stuck mm -hmm. if something isn't working, mm -hmm. whether it be, you know, or I wasn't getting the information I wanted on cancer. I went and got second opinion. Mm -hmm. um, chose not to work with certain doctors because I didn't feel a connection to them. I didn't feel comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. And do you think that's important that folks be able to do that? Yeah, I think that, you know, your doctor's not God. Mm -hmm. And, and if you're not really comfortable true. with the information that you're getting from them and it doesn't feel right to you, I think it's important to seek out second opinions. Mm -hmm. um, I counseled a friend just recently who was getting information about her journey with breast cancer mm -hmm. that she might want to get a second opinion. Mm -hmm based on what I was hearing from my doctor, her information was very different. Mm -hmm. So I just was like, you just may want to seek out another opinion if, if this doesn't feel right to you. Um, well, there's a lot of changes that have happened for you and a lot of living that you have done. And um, we're actually doing a two-part series on this for our audience. And so this is actually our first part of Stacy being willing to talk about her wake-up call and uh, the second part we're getting ready to um, host and will be hosting. Um, we'll follow this hopefully in your next month series. And we're going to talk about not only recap this a bit, but we're also going to talk about um, other pieces that resulted from her wake up call. Other opportunities that she's explored in other places that she's gone to in her world, in her you know, personal life, in her professional life, and just with her children, because we have moved four years beyond this. Right. That's right. So um, for this part, we're going to hold tight and we're going to break and, and go to the, the next episode. But I want to again introduce Stacy Henning. She again is the marketing director at GRE. And um, she is so gracious to come and talk with us about her experience and her wake up call with regard to breast cancer and how that helped her maybe make some different changes and actually how she actually walked through the experience. So Stacy, for this month anyway, we thank you and we're going to come back to the okay. next month and uh, look at more pieces. So hold tight because this woman is also a traveler. Thank you again. If you would like to connect with Stacy, please contact her through the Inspirit website, inspirit7.com. Again, inspirit7.com is the website and you can email us and we will get you directly to Stacy if you would like to have some great conversation with her. Thank you again and thanks for coming in, Stacy. This program was produced through Penfield Community Television in Penfield, New York.